Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest this week stands at the intersection between two very hot issues. That's comedy and religion. James Carey is a writer for radio and television. He created the award-winning Think the Unthinkable on Radio 4, and he also contributed to Bluestone 42 and to Miranda. He is also the author of a number of books, the latest of which is The Sacred Art of Joking. And he's also a member of the General Synod of the Church of England. Welcome very much, James. Uh, it's good to, good to see you. Uh, you haven't exactly made life easy for yourself with this particular path, have you not? Yes, I don't <laughs> think. Yes, I'm also a Calvinist, so I think the path has chosen me. Um, but right. yes, no, okay. I, like, I like comedy. I've always loved comedy. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really see the point of anything else growing up. I just wanted to watch comedy and watching all the great sitcoms of mm. our time, like Porridge and, yes, Prime Minister, which is probably my favourite of the lot. Um, but also um, have a Christian faith, which I acquired really from my school, and um, uh, and since then I've always I've always been a I've always been the weird one because in the world of um, in the world of comedy I've always been the weirdo who's actually uh, a Christian, which is not all that common. But then in in my church world I'm the weirdo who works for the BBC, yeah. which is in their view full of full of um, non-Christians and, and, and socialists. But actually, uh, let's take that point, I mean, mm. it, you know, is that a caricature? Um, or are you unusual at the BBC? Or for that matter, actually in broadcast? Well, th here we go. I attended a comedy conference. I was one of the speakers at uh, the Craft of Comedy a couple of years ago up in North Wales. And the Today programme were there. And there were about 100 people in the room, including professional comedians and writers, commissioners, controllers, as well as um, uh, other delegates at the conference oh. and the Today programme asked and you can listen to this if you go back into the archives um, the Radio 4 programme would like to talk to somebody here who voted to leave is there anyone here <laughs> who voted to leave uh, uh. and we were all having lunch 100, 150 people one voice came up yep uh, yeah. that's me uh, uh. so I was the only person in that room for example to vote leave Yes. Um, and so what that tells you is that there is a sort of reinforcing uh, echo chamber uh, around comedy, which is not just the BBC, I think obviously Channel 4 and um, other broadcasters have got this, because everyone moves around in all these different yeah. jobs. Yeah. So there is undoubtedly, you know, I think um, uh, Goodhart's book uh, about the, the anywheres and the somewheres or... Yes, or the road stuff. to yeah, somewhere. Yeah, road to somewhere. I mean, mm. I, think that's, I, th I think that's a very accurate portrayal of people who are disproportionately influential within the media and Lots of comedians are graduates. They all went off to university. Mm. They're slightly, you know, disconnected. And I'm, I'm like that too. But um, for whatever reason, I moved back to to the West Country where I'm from. And um, so, I, you know, I, I would probably think of myself more as a somewhere than an anywhere. Right. Um, but yeah. So, but but because of the nature of the the BBC and what it is, uh, it is full of people who were absolutely astonished when a when a conservative government is re-elected yeah, yeah. um uh, when uh, when a republican is made president of the american uh, you know in the american election and then when britain votes to leave mm. um the only thing that astonishes me is at the time of recording it still looks like we're pretending that we are actually going to leave the european union mm. uh, what i thought would happen is that we'd vote to leave yeah. and everyone would go well that was all very interesting <laughs> like with the lisbon treaty yeah. and then five ten years time we'd be talking about the eu and we go we voted to leave that, didn't we? I thought we were going to be leaving, and then nothing happened. Oh, it's, it's, um, it's I was sort dreadful. of assumed that we would just be ignored completely on that one. But it, it, it's absolutely dreadful. It's interesting you, you, you made the point there about the BBC, or uh, I, I myself was in broadcasting for a long time. Mm. Uh, it's not so dissimilar in other you know, areas. Uh, it's not just the BBC. They mm. take the lead, if you like. Yeah. They set the agenda. Um, but it, it's not just, is it, about parties and like not being fair to the Tory party and being you know, too fair to Labour or whatever. It's actually a whole set of cultural attitudes. I mean, Absolutely. I picked on something actually that you've written about um, on your on your blog, which was about the BBC's attitude to religion. Mm. And I think you—it's not, it's not interested in religion. Well, you say it's not interested in religion, but also you say in it that it's actually more interested in promoting. What, if, if I get it right, you call a Judeo-Christian, post-Judeo-Christian -Judeo mm. sort of quasi-socialist secularism yeah is that right yeah it's sort of a sentimental sort of form of you know 
it's an inoffensive form of what used to be a version of Christianity. Yeah, it's sort yeah. of a second-hand thing where it's the kind of thing where um, you know, it sort of reminds me of how, um, for example, the likes of Polly Toynbee, who, who hate Christianity, yeah. hate the line, the witch in the wardrobe, for example, when I remember seeing her asking, writing about it, and when she talks about Aslan being Jesus, mm. um, she sort of hates that idea and just said, nobody asked Jesus to die for us. Um, you know, I'm not, you know we, we don't need religion. Uh, all we need is common sense and decency. And you think, well, where do you think they 2019 British common sense and decency comes from? It comes from Judeo-Christianity. Um, so I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to have the, the Christianity, but without the Christ. Um, and I think... You can run on that for a while, and I think we have been running on that since the 30s, 40s, mm. 50s, and eventually the fumes run out. You can't, and now we're sort of running on the memory of the fumes, if you, if you see what I mean. That's a very nice way of putting it, actually. Because there's been a book out recently by Tom Holland, you probably mm. know, where he's, uh, he's more, you know, he's saying, look, you know, Christianity is at the basis of our civilization, our, our, our society, and it's, it's wrong to, to deny that, but also, there's this sort of sense in which, you know, somehow secularism, and I, I'm secular, I'm not, mm, sure. but, you know, does this mean that, you know, I'm fooling myself if I think that what I consider to be decent behaviour, whatever, does not come from religion? Is, is that what you're sort of more or less it has, saying? Yeah, it has, it has to have come from some form of Christianity, because if you go to other countries in the world, if you go to um, Pakistan, yeah. um, if you go to China, if you go to Indonesia, if you go to um, to uh, New Delhi or whatever it's called now, Calcutta and all these different places. If you go to India, mm. then um, then they have a completely different understanding of what common sense and decency is. And that's because they've had a completely different worldview for the last thousand years based on mm. a completely different theology. Um, and that's completely, that, that's completely understandable. So yeah. the idea that we sort of pulled secularism out of thin air in this country, I sort of just, I, I can't see how that could possibly have happened. Mm. Um, and the, the irony is, of course, that it's, it's the Reformation uh, in the 1500s that made all of this sort of pluralism possible. Yeah. Um, so in a way, Christianity's greatest gift uh, to secularism is to say, well, you get to not be a Christian. You get, yeah, to, yeah. You get to refuse. You get to have, yeah. different, um, to get to have a different faith or no faith. Um, and that is not self-evident to, to many people in, in, in other cultures. So to deny, and we can have a debate about which one of them is, is true or based on something, or, but it seems like a, we have to admit, I think Tom Holland's right, I mean, it's like, this is where it comes from. Where do you think it comes from? The BBC has this thing it promotes, you know, which is, I imagine it probably thinks that it is, doesn't need religion, obviously. Yeah. Even, interestingly, I think you pointed this out, the title now is not it's not head of religion and ethics it's actually editor of ethics and religion, religion. yes well, there you go turned it around yeah where do you think ethics come from they come from religion but the, the point is really james is um you know in a way which came first chicken or the egg i would have thought that the bbc will probably think well we're just reflecting the way society is now or do you think they have helped it along do you think that you know as it were their anti-religion help the situation to what we have now? Or? Yes. I don't know whether they're anti-religion. Um, it feels more like uh, the BBC probably would make less religious broadcasting if it could, but it has it's statutorily yeah. required to make yeah, a certain yeah. amount. And it does. And the stuff that it makes, uh, some people are helped by, so I don't want to um, uh, throw, it, throw it all under the bus. But the BBC yearns to you know, win awards for natural history yeah, yeah. and for, for news reporting. Yeah. Um, it's not trying to win awards for religious broadcasts. You know, happily accept them. But, um, but I think the, it's more that it's a bit like comedy as well. It's like, d d does comedy lead the way in terms of changing attitudes or does it reflect them? And I think it just contributes to a, a feedback loop, doesn't it? So mm. a, a comedian will be, the job of a comedian is to sort of notice things and mm. put things together slightly earlier than society has and they can say oh isn't it funny how this or that or I mean I sort of noticed a thing the other day where there was a whole load of people gathered together and they all had their heads down and they were looking at their phones and I thought there's a sort of a possible joke in how there's, there would be a caricature of people in the 15th century yeah, yeah. all shuffling into church with their heads down 
looking like complete idiots believing in something that isn't actually there. And yeah, oh, yeah. weren't they stupid? And, and here we all are voluntarily just doing this with our heads down, shuffling around, exactly. looking at something that isn't yeah. actually there. Yeah. Um, and so what the comedian does is he sort of puts things together uh, that, are, that are comic. And he does that before everybody's noticed them. Yeah. Um, so he or she, their, their job is to kind of get there slightly early. But if they get there way earlier, then nobody really quite gets the joke. You're sort of trying to just sort of, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're just sort of leading people along uh, like that. Um, whereas if you suddenly come out of nowhere, if you, if you, if you did a 2019 progressive comedy act um, 30 years ago, mm. uh, people would have just been completely mystified by mm. what you were talking about. Mm. Um, you know, even, even 15 years ago, do you, I mean, you remember when uh, civil partnerships came in. Mm. Everybody who was in favour of same-sex civil partnerships said, well, there's no question that this is going to lead to same-sex marriage because no, nobody wants that. Nobody's asking for that. Mm, yeah. And then suddenly it's like, oh, my goodness. And, mm. and now you're on the wrong side of history yeah, um, and yeah. everyone conveniently forgets mm. uh, the narrative that was, that was, um, that was told before. Um, so it is interesting how the, the BBC, in the same way as newspapers and all, all culture, really, and all art, um, comes which is it's just trying to get slightly ahead get slightly ahead and there are people who are you know who we would look back and say well they were prophets of their time but they died completely penniless because everyone thought well this is nonsense mm -hmm. and therefore when you have an exhibition of the impressionists everyone just thinks well what on earth is that I mean mm -hmm. that kind of I guess that looks like a bridge mm. but why didn't you actually paint a bridge some people of course still still say that yes of course them, yes mean, uh, you know um and, and with, you know we're always told that oh when whenever so and so this first this this concerto was first performed this yeah, symphony yeah. was first performed in paris there was a riot yeah. and you sort of think well was there but you know there, there probably was and people thought well music shouldn't sound like this when you i mean just go back to bbc for a minute you, you you've written a lot for the bbc mm. um how does it actually work, James? I mean, you, you're commissioned, you go and write the thing or whatever. Mm. They, do they know what to expect from you? At what stage and do they start to become involved? Do they ever say, well, we can't say this, we can't say that? You know, did you have experience of that sort of thing? Um, not particularly, but I think once, once they've commissioned the show and the show's up and running, as it were, there are editorial guidelines and policies which are, you know, eminently yeah. sensible. And and overall, I was very, you know, so I, I made a show, full credit to them, you know, I made a show about bomb disposal in Afghanistan and it was a comedy and um, called Bluestone 4-2. And, mm. um, and they really defended that. Um, and it, obviously they were slightly nervous about how people would receive that. Yeah. Um, and there were lots of very sort of troubling themes that took place within the show and and and, and they backed it so uh they're, they're a good bunch to have on your side in a scrab yes. um once once they're happy with it and and so they do go out and and uh, go into bat for things um but yeah it's always a conversation and occasionally you you dig your heels in and say no i'm sorry that's the way it should be um but you you know it's 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 always a bit of a feedback process um, and that's the same with any broadcaster, really, mm. and I'm, I'm same with newspapers and mm. all these kinds of things. And you're you're kind of aware that that the people, for in, my, in my point of view, I'm aware that the people who who are full time staff at the BBC have generally a, a, a fairly different outlook from me. Mm. Um, and that's and all, all things considered, therefore, I think it's always interesting to me that that the people on the left look at the BBC and just say, oh, it's just, it just defends the Tories yeah. all the time or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you think if you are on the right, you just think, I don't really quite mm. see how you can say that. Mm. But actually, given what the political views of the people who tend to work for the BBC actually are, mm. the news is actually surprisingly fair. Mm. Um, and actually, a lot of their big hitters in terms of political commentators are, are from the right, like Nick Robinson mm. or um, Andrew Neil and people mm. like that. Um, but they're in an impossible situation, so I don't want to say the BBC are the, you know, are, are the big are the big villains here. I think that there's no question because they pay a lot of my mortgage, by the way. Right, so I'll okay, be a bit okay, no, fair enough. But even so, you know, I'm happy to be fairly robust. <laughs> I think that I think it's the general cultural drift of the BBC. I think which is it obviously gets you know a lot of people very concerned. I mean, there's no question question about that. Um, I think it's um, interesting, you know. You, 
you being a Christian, you hear this argument an awful lot now, or have, or have over the past few years, that somehow or other there's nothing you can't say about Christianity. You can mock it, you can joke about it, uh, compared to other religions, say mm. Islam or whatever, where you can't say anything. Um, first of all, is that a picture that you recognize? I mean, uh, you know, because I was thinking about it, looking, you know, when we, before we spoke today, mm. and I was thinking, well, you know, if you take Life of Brian, or if you take Dave Allen, you know, would would you have those today? I mean, I, I, I'm i trying to think, you know, when was the last time, maybe Jerry Springer, but mm. do you think that's a fair criticism or do you, you know, that basically Christianity is the only mockable one? I do hear that view a lot. And I do know that the sort of people that I go to church with and, and, and meet, they do feel that they're, that they don't really see why their religion should be the, 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 the punch bag. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a view, I mean, I talk about it in, in my book, that, um, I mean, Anne Widdicombe did a documentary about, partly about this subject uh, with a comedian, Marcus Brigstock. Um, and she wrote in The Telegraph, you know, why is it okay for, you know, the, the comedians are all very happy to make jokes about Christianity, but they don't want to make jokes about Islam. And rather implying moral, rather implying cowardice on the part of comedians. And actually, if you know comedians, they tend to lean into these things. They, they're actually, they like prodding things and they, they're, not, they're not particularly scared of, of a fight or what the consequences might be. I don't genuinely think that's the reason. The, the reasons are a little bit more boring and less conspiratorial in that in order for you to make jokes about something, people have to have a basic understanding of it. And therefore, you can make jokes about Christianity because there is just about enough uh, residual understanding of what Christianity is for you to be able to make a joke about also, it. Also, do you mean, for example, the ceremonial of it? If you think of Dave Allen, yeah. it's about vicars and pulpits and everything, wasn't Absolutely, it? yeah. So he was doing lots of jokes about um, Catholic priests and, um, and that kind of thing. If you look at the stats, an awful lot of people still end up at some point in a church at some point mm. in the course mm. of a year. Either they go to a wedding or they go to a funeral or they go to a baptism or they go at Christmas. And therefore, you, they have a narrative. And, and all of those are relatively serious occasions because they're big life events. And therefore, if you're a comedian, you're looking to mess around yeah. and you, you want a serious place in which you can start to have misbehavior or you can start to be comic. And so that's a natural place for a comedian to go, oh, wouldn't it be funny if... And, and therefore, there was a joke on Goodness Gracious Me, which is a joke which I think... Uh, Ofcom or, or somebody said you, the BBC may never broadcast this joke ever again, yes. which is where the Indian couple the, um, who were desperate to be British, um, they turn up to a communion ceremony and they get handed a wafer and one of them gets out some mango chutney and puts it on top and eats the wafer. Mm -hmm. And Anne Widdicombe, as now a Catholic actually, um, says, well, this is the body of Christ and mm -hmm. you, you, can't, you can't make a joke about that. Which you go, well, that's a perfectly decent joke. I, I get that you might be offended by it, but it's not the worst joke in the world, and it works as a joke, and it's quite funny. Um, but, you could, but the joke only works because people know that you sort of get handed a wafer at this communion service, and they may not understand what it exactly refers to or how the Last Supper works or anything like that. But the problem is, if you want to make jokes about Islam, then you need to go, okay, so what does... Uh, what does, an, what does a Muslim service look like? What mm. happens? What happens when uh, a Muslim is baptised or whatever their equivalent of it is? What happens at a Muslim wedding or funeral? Well, given that Muslims are only a single digit percentage of the population, most people don't really know. OK, what about the, story, the famous stories in the Quran? How can we... OK, are any of them as well known as the nativity story, for example? So you could do a funny nativity story, but they're not. And so the raw material that you need for the comedy mm. is actually not there. And I think that is, much as I'm, I'm happy with conspiracy theories, don't, mm. don't get me wrong, I think on this particular occasion, um, that, that you just don't have enough. So there's enough. So in the 80s, Spitting Image could make jokes about Catholics and Protestants because mm. there was essentially a war going on in Northern Ireland. Mm. And so there were jokes about Ian Paisley um, and there were jokes about, the, you know, they had His Holiness the Pope, who was like a rock star, wasn't mm. he? If you remember the, the yeah. Spitting Image version of the Pope. Um, well, you can still just about do jokes like that, although anyone under 40 would find it mystifying, I, I think. But if you want to do jokes about what's the difference between a Sunni and a Shia, mm. 
Well, good luck finding a punchline for that that anyone's going to know the answer to because most people don't know the difference. The only thing, I mean, what therefore, anything about that, uh, James, is that, you know, there's a huge hit show at the moment on in London. It's been going for ages, The Book of Mormon. Yes. Now, this is a huge hit. It's mocking of the Mormon church and whatever. It's foul mouths, all the rest of it. Mm. Um, I would say that basically, the majority of people don't know very much about the Mormon church, yet it's still. Yes. mockable and it's still the butt of jokes. I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, surely when, when you talk about it being, basically you're talking about the need for common knowledge, mm. couldn't you also just say that it's downright fear? That basically if 12 people get murdered at yeah. Charlie Hebdo, yes. then basically you're not going to make a joke. I completely accept that. Um, I think there is, a, there is an element of Mormonism where there is probably enough in the ether for there to be something to go on because and the show starts with somebody knocking on your door the st show starts with yeah. hello and and they kind of give you enough information that you need to know mm. about mormonism in order to get the jokes mm. um and if you propose to do the same with islam um then you would run into problems for the, exactly the reasons that you are suggesting so to say that there is no fear is obviously not credible um, this is not to say that people are cowards yes. at all, because it's, a, it's a, it possibly a realistic yeah. re response to the situation. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, so I have some, and that's why I wrote the book, yeah. is because we, we, we live in a world now where a joke, that, a joke can be taken out, either out of context or even within context. No, nobody, nobody misread the jokes in Charlie Hebdo. You know, they, they, mm. They, mm. they were done exactly as they were intended to be, and some people didn't like them, and in broad daylight went and shot you know, 10 people, 12 people who were actually involved in the production of that magazine. So never before have jokes been more serious. They can end your career. Uh, they can end your, you know, there was, a, at the time of recording, as it were, there was a very recent spat over Joe Brand saying I was going to ask you about acid. that, yeah. actually. I mean, that's an interesting point, you know, as a, as a comedy writer. Mm. Should she have apologised? She did apologise. for this. this is when she talked about throwing battery acid over yeah. politicians, I think. Uh, I think it's no guesses for who she was thinking of. Um, no, I think she ended up apologising, didn't she? Yeah. Do you well, think I she think, should have done? I mean... I don't think... I think there are times when um, an apology... You, you know when people demand for an apology that that's never going to be enough um, because the, the, the Twitch fort mob are fine, they're really in full mode and, and there's nothing you can yeah, say to yeah. placate the mob. I think in her case, she can say, yeah, OK, fair enough. If anything, the program makers could probably have thought, oh, actually, maybe that one doesn't feel right yeah, for yeah, now. Yeah. But she's made jokes in the past about physical violence mm. against men, mm. which in the context of her, her persona, her act, the fact that generally people have paid money to go to a, a gig, they know what they're getting yeah. within the context of the show. She's joking. Um, she, and therefore, because mm. uh, but because it is extreme, and she's a comedian, we all get that it's a joke. She's not mm. advocating mm. violence. So I think we can. Should should she apologise? Well, maybe. Should people just grow up a bit and yeah, realise she's obviously exactly. joking? Yeah, 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 I guess so too. Yeah, yeah. But it, I have some sympathy with those who say she should apologise. Um, because they're often the ones who are, when they joke, they're told that they should apologise. Yeah, so when yeah, a joke comes yeah. from a different political perspective, then, then that's the end of your career. Uh, but Joe Brand is probably, uh, she's, I think she's going to be all right. One thing actually that you, you mentioned there, which I think is crucial, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is that now, you say comedy has become very, well, dangerous possibly, mm. you know, and that is because you mentioned smartphones. Mm. Everyone has a smartphone, right? So the comedy goes out of the context in which it was, mm. and it ends up being seen somewhere around the world or whatever, totally without context, and bang, the balloon can go up. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, and, it's, it's, and that will have consequences. Um, and so you can record unbeknown, you know, you can go to, I think Louis C.K. had this yeah. when, when he was sort of trying to inch his way back into being a member of the human race. Yeah. Um, he did a, an after hours gig and I think somebody recorded it and he made a, he made a joke about uh, one of the guys. Uh, he made a joke about some of the kids who'd been a victim of a mass shooting or something. Yeah. And so suddenly everyone just thought, oh, Louis C.K. is every bit as terrible a human being as we thought he was all along. Mm. Despite the fact that he was a very famous, very well-paid, very successful comedian for a very long time. 
um, saying some very challenging and troubling things, very skillful comedian. Mm. Um, but there, but it, it is disingenuous to be in a situation where everybody knows, you know, we know who he is, we know what he's said, we're in a, we're in a comedy show, it's a late night thing, and he's gonna say some things. Mm. To then record it, take it out of that context, and just say, well, is that acceptable? So, well, yeah, yeah. and I, I've, I, mean, I say in the book, and I say it a lot, one of the least funny things on earth is a, um, the presenter of Newsnight reading back a joke that has been made to a comedian who made it, yes, you know, yeah. as if it's oh, sort terrible. of being, being yeah, held up yeah, through yeah, tongs. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. In your so-called comedy set, you joked, you know, blah, 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 blah. And usually a member of the lobby group who was professionally offended by this joke. So again, at the time of recording recently, yeah, yeah. there was another spat about the funniest joke at this year's Edinburgh Fringe was, was, was a pun about the word Tourette's and Florette's. Yeah. You know, somebody says, uh, the joke was along the lines of, I'm wandering around saying cauliflower and um, broccoli. I think I've got Florette's. Yes, yeah. and pretty, pretty tame stuff. Yeah, it's, 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 it's you know. <laughs> Not and to so, say name. <laughs> and so, it's, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I talked about this on, you know, I, yeah. as usual, I normally get a phone call about this sort of thing. Oh, could you come on the radio programme and yeah, talk about yeah, jokes? Yeah. And, it, and, and so in the blurb, it said, when somebody introduced it, and they just said, and you know, Tourette sufferers were, um, uh, were, were offended by this joke. To which you immediately want to say, do you know what? I bet you loads of them weren't. Yeah. But the head of the organization who is, in, you know, who are trying to help people with Tourette's has taken offense and is professionally offended. And that's completely fine. They're, they're defending their, you know, their corner and they're gonna get their 15 minutes of, of, of media coverage and that's all fair play. But, you know, you have these round table discussions where somebody who was offended is also sitting there and suddenly this comedian who has done a joke in this context, his joke has been voted the funniest joke of the Edinburgh Fringe, which of course it isn't. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's quite a good joke. The second funny, funniest joke at the Edinburgh Fringe was about taking antidepressants. Mm. And nobody seemed to mind about that one because mm. <laughs> it didn't yeah, win. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so, so we have these discussions where the joke is then removed of its context, it's read out in an overlit news studio and please explain yourself. And you just think the skill of us, you know, comedy happens in a time, mm. in a place yeah. with people. And I really feel for comedians, you know, actual stand-up comedians because their jokes have to be done out loud in front of people. Yes. And something can seem funny written down. They all do try out nights, they all have new material nights. And the very act of saying a, a joke, they sort of don't know how it's going to go. And the more experienced you get, the more stronger sense that you get. But even strong comedians on new act nights will do, will do 50 jokes and five of them might survive. Mm. And as a, as a punter, you might be watching it, listening to some of these jokes, just going, that's a terrible joke. And you're really, how could you not know that that's such a bad joke? But that's, the process is so slippery. Yeah. So the very act of doing the joke, it has to be done in public. And so for therefore to say, oh, you're a comedian, are you? You know, <laughs> well, this, this could be interesting. You're gonna, have to do all, you're gonna have to do all of your practicing in public. And if you make one single mistake, we're gonna end your career. Uh, absolutely. Um, good luck, this had better be funny. Wow. <laughs> One yeah. thing actually, uh, we're sort of about to finish really, one, one thing I want to ask you, particularly as a writer, as a, as a, as a comedy writer, is, is that you write characters, mm. right? you put words in their mouth, it does not mean that you agree necessarily with what they say, that's the whole nature of creativity I would have thought. Yes. If you take something such as To Death Us Do Part, Johnny Spate when he was writing that, yeah. Alf Garnet was writing it from a, quite a liberal position, I think, oh, he yes. was like mocking you. Yeah. But the thing is, do you not feel, as a writer now, that in fact, these lines have become so blurred that actually, if you even write something for a character, you will be pounced upon yeah. by the twitch fork mob, mob yeah. as somehow or other, you know, believing the same thing or endorsing whatever you might write. Not just you, but yeah. any writer. Yeah. This is a, this is a, a real problem. Isn't yeah, it? I, I think it is a problem. And I think to say my own sort of faith community are as guilty of this as everybody where they assume that because I'm a Christian, I need to write characters who basically all say Christian things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually Christians should know better because Jesus tells parables 
about terrible people doing terrible things. Yes. And you can almost imagine Jesus telling the parable of the Good Samaritan, the most famous parable there is probably, about you know a man goes on a journey and some robbers grab him, beat him, take all his money and leave him for dead. And you can imagine people just going, <clears throat> um, Jesus, I think, I think you're glorifying violence. Um, I don't think you should be telling parables <laughs> like that. And actually, the people who tell Jesus off for the things that he says, funny enough, are religious people. Yeah. And isn't it funny? It is funny that who actually has Jesus killed? Oh, that's right, religious people. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, you know, yeah, it couldn't yeah. get any funnier in a really dark sort of way. Um, which is why my sort of theory that Easter, Fr Easter and Good Friday are actually funny. But people do have a terrible time understanding that. So in Bluestone 4-2, bomb disposed in Afghanistan, all of these soldiers swear a lot. That's how they talk. You shouldn't, you shouldn't talk like that. I don't, I don't want to talk like that. And I would tell my kids not to talk like that. But that's how they talk like that. And, for, and when, a, when a bomb goes off near you, you don't say, oh dear. No, That's no, just not no, how people talk. No, it's not no, real. No. So you, your obligation as a comedian, as actually as a Christian, I would say, is to tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. And I often then would say to you, well, if you're offended by the language, for example, you're offended by some of the things that happen within the show, well, that's good. Mm, mm. You should be offended by things. Actually, if you're, if you're offended by something, it proves you're paying attention. It proves you're alive. It proves that you've still got critical faculties. So actually being, a, it's, like, it's like touching something and discovering that it's hot. But it shouldn't actually give you particular rights necessarily. No, yeah, should well, it shouldn't. You know? you, you, I mean, I think sometimes people feel that they've been either assaulted by yeah, being yeah, offended yeah. or that within a religious context that they haven't been in some way made unclean or yeah. tainted by it. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's not the case. Um, be, just, just something has happened that you don't like. Yes. And therefore, you don't need to ascribe poor motives to the person who said it or did it. They don't necessarily need to apologise. It's just maybe unintended collateral of this is what life in, this is what life in a country of 65 million people looks mm. like in an always on social media mm, culture. Mm, mm. Um, it's not possible to make a joke in a room of, I would say, more than 10 people which couldn't be either willfully misconstrued or correctly construed mm. that it doesn't, you know, you could do a joke about somebody in a car and someone could say, well, I actually had a very serious car accident or my, my sister had a very serious car accident a, a week ago and I'm not. So, well, you, you ought to know that. Of course not. So yeah. I think people, are, people assume that they have a right to live in a society where they are never offended. And, and that is insane. Um, it's unrealistic, but also unnecessary because when we're offended by something, when we see something happening, when we're offended by a story where the good guy is suddenly behaving in the wrong way and I'm, I'm worried, you can watch, you know, um, It's a Wonderful Life. Mm. Wow, what an incredible movie. And people have got this chocolate box image of that movie in their mm. mind. It gets really dark. Mm, mm. And when James Stewart starts yelling at his kids, oh my goodness, you're really just like, oh blimey, this is, this is really dark. And, but you need to go to those dark places in order to find the light. You know, you need, you know that, that is the context yeah. in which yeah. these ha things are happening. So I think this idea that, you know, no one should be, you know, I should never be offended. I was offended by that. And therefore you should apologize. It's like those statements are not as closely connected as you think they are. I think, don't you think that the problem as well is that for writers, mm. actually for writers for anyone doing anything creative, uh, essentially there is the possible temptation just to simply self-censor. Yeah. I mean, you think, actually, why give myself grief, you know, it's going to be offended by that, they're going to be offended, they're going to be offended, you know, yeah. I might as well do it. And that is a real problem. I think it's very dark in that yeah. sense. Yeah, I think, well, actually, I, I wonder if, um, I mean, I think writers and comedians particularly do, do are fairly attracted to things that are quite subversive or potentially offensive. But then I think there's an element of second guessing that goes on yeah. when it comes to selecting ideas. Or, and, but it's interesting, isn't it, that the most profitable um, forms of broadcasting at the moment are streaming yeah. services. And yeah. they're doing some very strange and troubling and, and challenging things like, you know, you know Chernobyl or, um, you know, Netflix series that do, do seem to be very, um, uh, very, very subversive. So actually people, people are prepared to watch things with very, very adult themes and be treated like grown-ups. Um, 
but it is i think the you know the, the i think it was david frost who said that the, the you know, television allows you to be entertained by people in your living room that you wouldn't allow in the house. <laughs> and therefore, right. <laughs> there is an element of, I've switched on the TV and suddenly yeah. someone said this thing and I wasn't really prepared for that. Yeah. So there is an emotional kind of hit that then makes you feel rather angry. And then the other, th- but the other thing though, and this is why social media creates its vortex. I was doing a, a panel on this recently at the Greenbelt uh, Festival. Um, and Elf Lyons was a comedian who was taking part in it. She made a really good point that when you sit there watching something on TV, 10, 15 years ago, you would have been offended by something and just thought, oh, I don't, oh, that's not right. Hmm. And then you'd have stopped watching it, turned it off, had a bath and gone to bed. And, and forgotten it. about it, yeah, yeah. And the next morning, you know, probably mm, you've forgotten about mm. it or someone might mention it. You go, oh, yeah, I saw that thing and that, and that was mm. that. But now you're offended by it. Twitter. I'm offended mm. by this. Mm. Oh, other people are offended by it. Oh, there's mm. a hashtag. Mm. Oh, we might end someone's career here. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. great. And social media, unfortunately, rewards outrage and rewards anger because you sort of can't really challenge anger and offence in a way. Just saying to somebody, get over it, mm. seems quite unkind. Um, I and mean, sometimes it is. But actually, that is the right response occasionally. I think probably the... Uh the moral to that story is just stay away from the black mirror, isn't it? Stay away from the black screen. Or yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. And thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. I was going to mention again your book, the, the latest book, The Sacred Art of Joking. It's got a lot of very, very interesting uh, discussions in it. Thanks very, very much for coming on and uh, all the very, very best of the future. Thank you very, very much for watching. Uh, do subscribe, please. Keep subscribing and we will see you next time. Thank you.